Welcome to Data Science Perspectives. This series focuses on analytics and data science professionals from across industry to learn about how their career unfolded, what skills they look for when hiring, and what trends they think are coming next. I'm your host, Bill Franks. Let's get to it. Welcome to this episode of Data Science Perspectives. I'm your host, Bill Franks. Today, we're going to be joined by Kayer Desai. I first met Kayer almost 20 years ago when we were both at Teradata. And as you'll hear, he's had some very interesting and influential roles in the data analytics space over the years. He always has unique insights to share, and I'm sure we're going to hear some of those today. His entire 30-year career has been spent looking at different components of data analytics and AI, most recently as a global vice president uh, for Herbalife Nutrition and chief data officer for uh, brokerage TD Ameritrade prior to their purchase by Charles Schwab. Before that, he had held some senior uh, data and analytics professional services and consulting roles at both Intensity and Teradata. And he began his career with MicroStrategy, where he was one of the handful of employees that started the company. And uh, then he helped it grow to the publicly traded global firm that it is today. And they actually did that without any venture capital, which is quite impressive. He has bachelor's degrees in both physics and electrical engineering, as well as a master's in bio- biomedical engineering, all of those from Washington University in St. Louis. And with that, let's welcome Kyer to the show. Thanks for joining me on the show today, Kyer. Uh, nice to be here, Bill. Thanks for having me. I always like to start because everyone has their own story about what drew them initially into this world of data and analytics? So let's start there. What got you? What got you into this field? Yeah, you know the interesting thing is um, back in 1992, um, when I was still in college, uh, you know, doing medical research, I never planned to be in data and analytics. This was a complete uh, happenstance, and uh, what ended up happening was I was working on the team that invented the PET scan at WashU St. Louis. And my job was to, you know, uh, write or rewrite some of the algorithms uh, that, that, that put a picture on the screen uh, after you've drunk, drunk some nuclear juice, if you will. And uh, to also write the code to then figure out where to put the dot on the screen. And now we call that a big data problem. But it just so happened that one weekend I ended up meeting um, uh, a gentleman, Mike Saylor, who was talking about doing some big things in data. And he talked about how in the future, data was going to become the currency of the world. He talked about how data was going to end up knowing more about you than your doctor. Data was going to help machines know more about themselves and self-heal, right? And that's what got me excited. That vision is what got me excited. And um, lo and behold, uh, I actually ended up leaving a full scholarship uh, at WashU in St. Louis and uh, went off and helped uh, him and five other folks end up uh, creating MicroStrategy. So that's what got me started, was just the strength of that vision. There were no plans. Well, that, and that brings up my second question, which was, you know, you got into the business intelligence and reporting side of things very, very early. And it, it, it's funny now that some of the younger viewers um, may not be as familiar with MicroStrategy as in the old days, but it was one of the original powerhouse reporting tools that kind of helped uh, reporting analytics go mainstream. So what, uh, you know, what did you learn from that process of building one of those first enterprise re- reporting tools? And what were some of those challenges in the early days when obviously the, the tools and systems available couldn't handle the, you know, what was then uh, considered pretty substantive processing as well as we can today? Yeah, no, I, and, and, and thanks for recognizing the fact that this company was an original pioneer in this space. Um, uh, if I could get into some of the details around how we came up with these ideas, I think that's a separate uh, recording on its own. But so to answer your question, you know, what did we learn through this entire process, right? Um, Really, learning came on two fronts. I learned a lot personally, right? Like I said earlier, I didn't plan to be in this space. So I learned a lot about how you create a company from scratch, right? Without any venture capital. 
in a new space where people didn't really know what we were doing, right? Many people told me to go get a real job. But I learned a lot about how you go be scrappy and grow a company to become a publicly traded behemoth, which to this day is still a publicly traded company and arguably the only business intelligence vendor that is now publicly traded, even 30 years later. So I, I, I consider that a huge, huge success um, uh, with a company uh, that's got quite a bit of staying power and, and was very innovative in its time. The other people, the, the other thing that I learned was the power of creating a corporate culture, right? Uh, people talk about culture today, but I, back at MicroStrategy, we were, we were religious about ensuring that the culture that we had within the company remained and strengthened, right? And, and, and culture ends up becoming an accelerating force as you are growing this new company as you are trying to indoctrinate people into your way of thinking, right? It permeates into other people, uh, your clients specifically, and it helps you create a movement around your new idea. And then of course, the last thing that I learned over there was to rally, uh, you know, how do you go about rallying people within organizations uh, around the cause, specifically your client companies that know nothing about BI and reporting that are struggling through all this. How do you get the, how do you rally them around this? But, um, Professionally, what I well, what I really learned, right, in creating uh, these BI tools in a space where you know none existed before, and you know to your earlier point, you know we had substandard uh, um, processing. We 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 had to adapt, and I will tell you that the, the the big wave that we were trying to ride back then was that if you remember. DBAs were creating hand-coded green bar reports, right? This is back in the early 90s. And when, when, when they were trying to do that, data, because of business process reengineering, people wanted more and more data. But, those, you know, there was only a few DBAs in the company, and these poor folks were working nights and weekends, but they could only churn out so much insight. And so our theory was that if we could put the power of reporting into each individual business user's hands, that would free up the DBA to go do some more hiring tasks. And it worked, right? A lot of people, a lot of people on the business side wanted to consume a lot of these insights. So much so that this idea grew and we grew into the next bottleneck, right? The next bottleneck being, well, we can't provide new and novel data sets in a timely enough fashion. Right. And so now people went back to the DBA saying this data that I'm looking at is great, but now I want this other type of data integrated into that data so I can now report on it. Right. So that became the next bottleneck. And I mean, and to this day, I don't know that we even 25 years later have solved that bottleneck in an effective way. I think what's happened is that business users have adapted and have onboarded new self-service technologies like Power BI and Tableau and have kind of done their own thing. But I think where we're headed right now is that these new self-service technologies are going to run us into the next bottleneck. And what we're starting to see this is the trust, the data trust bottleneck, right? Um, nothing fractures a pristine set of data fast enough uh, than arming every business user with their own self-service tool to go ingest their data and to do with it what they please. So they've got all their personal versions of the truth. And now that's created a trust bottleneck within a company. And that's the next thing we're going to have to solve. And I foresee that even after that, we're going to have a timeliness bottleneck. But at the end of the day, if you look at this trend over the last 30 years, right, this BI trend over the last 30 years, what's happening, in my opinion, is that companies are looking to drive towards becoming more and more proactive, right? In the first 10 to 15 years, companies were very reactive. Trying, trying to sort of react to what was happening to them. Data and, and business people are realizing this more has actually the power to help companies become more proactive. And um, as they realize this, right? As they realize that they can use data to foresee and forecast things, they're realizing that the ultimate effect is that it can help them lower their operating costs. And it can also help them to gain competitive advantage against their uh, peer group. And so that's going to be a journey. We're still about 10 to 15 years away from uh, having companies feel like they're truly proactive, but I think that's where we're headed with the BI and the data landscape. 
So one, one question related to the the early days of, of, of that company, you know, over time, I remember there was a period where MicroStrategy, Cognos, Business Objects were kind of the trifecta, the three big players. But in the really, really early days, did everybody get the potential when you went to clients of those those new BI tools right away? Or was there a period where you you all were getting a lot of resistance from companies saying, we don't, we don't see why we really need this uh, before the explosive growth happened? There was quite a bit of resistance, right? Uh, a lot of people were happy with the Green Bar reports. Um, there were specific industry groups, industry verticals that actually saw the value of data much faster than others. And I would say that retailers saw the value of data upfront, right? They were the earliest adopters of uh, the concept of centralizing your data, integrating your data so that they could understand their customers' trends so that they could then, you know, increase their margins. Because, you know, retailers typically operate on very, very thin margins. So they saw using data as an opportunity to really expand margins and become a lot more competitive in, in that space. So I think retail industries were sort of ahead of the curve, but you know, if you walked into a finance organization back then, you know, um, well, we did get the ugly stare in terms of why are you here, right? And more so in government agencies, right? Airlines, right? But, but I think over time, um, and this sort of happened as the internet started to become a thing, right? Late 90s, early 2000s is when many corporations woke up to the idea of using business intelligence tools and data analytics to really affect their corporate strategy. You know, uh, after your, your stint there, we could call that more on the, on the product side, you ended up uh, over really close to a couple decades, going through a couple of different consulting style roles. In fact, that's where you and I first met each other when we were both doing consulting uh, at Teradata. What led you over to that consulting side of things and what were some of your biggest takeaways uh, from that time consulting with you know large global enterprises around different aspects of data and analytics for so many years? Yeah, so when you're growing a company, you're automatically consulting. So I would say that I was always in the consulting space. Uh, you're, you're consulting and developing products at the same time. You're using a lot of your client engagements to really get feedback on product and developing actually at night, <laughs> right? And passing a lot of those features to your R&D organization in terms of what you need. Um, so development and consulting kind of go hand in hand a lot of these companies. But um, I decided that rather than tread that line, that I really wanted to help companies become successful with their data implementation. I just found joy in that, right? As opposed to developing product. I wanted to implement product. And I will say that I started my implementation journey more on implementing the te technical side of data analytics, implementing technologies. And I will tell you, initially it was really exciting, right? As, as a young person who had just started in a career, this was the thing, you're, you're getting to work on cutting edge tech, you're implementing cutting edge tech. And um, you saw a lot of this as not only helping customers, but sort of creating your resume for the future as a young, young early professional. But as time went on, right, what I began to see as a pattern was that here we are spending nights and weekends implementing all these te technologies we're missing birthdays, we're missing anniversaries, we're missing important life, uh, milestones in our life, you know, in exchange for, uh, you know, the, the joy of seeing this go live happen, right? Mm. And what I started to see time and time again was that a year or two after the go live, nobody was using this tech. It was shelfware. And after a while in my career, that began to gnaw. Was, guys, I, I believe in the value of data and analy analytics, and I know I'm not the only one. What's going on here? And this is where I thank my lucky graces, uh, you know, for actually crossing paths with Teradata. Um, it's a Teradata where I honestly feel I found my purpose and my passion, because I think Teradata at that point in time, and I'm talking circa 2005 timeframe, was a leader in making sure that they integrated a, co a company's business strategy with the technology strategy. And that idea was not commonplace in other companies, right? In, in most other companies, you're implementing tech for the sake of implementing tech. At Teradata, the focus was the business outcome. And how that really opened my eyes 
to how you go about connecting business outcomes to um, the tech implementation. How you go about actually valuing the impact a technology initiative can have on a company's earnings per share, on their revenue, on their cost decreases, right? We actually, a lot of people regard innovation as sort of on the tech side of things. I think we at Territa began to innovate a lot in terms of how you go about making these connections and how you go about innovating with regards to quantifying impact, right? So I don't want to diminish the fact that these innovations on the business side uh, are equally as important as the innovations on the tech side. And I find that that whole space of connecting business outcome with technology and quantifying it really began to consistently show the staying power of a technology initiative. I started to see that a year or two later, people were still using this technology and not only using it, they were wanting to expand on it, right? And it is, it is in that environment that I found my purpose, if you will, right? I found my calling is that this is where I feel the next set of innovations are and they're not technology related. The next set of innovations about how you go about explaining to boards and executive teams, the value of a data analytics set of initiatives, the impact it can have on a company and how you go about collaborating in creating this culture with them to where data is always included as part of their business strategy. How do you do that? And there's innovations to be had over there. So I, I know after you start on product, you move to consulting, you then spend some years at companies like TD Ameritrade on the client side. That's a, a broad breadth of types of companies to work for. What's, what's one of the skills or traits you have that you think help make you successful across those different environments? Yeah, so the first and foremost is being able to communicate to different audiences. Um, typically when we start off in our career, we're very good at, at communicating technical knowledge to technical people, right? And that's, 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 I don't want to diminish the importance of that. I mean, that, that, that is fairly difficult to do. But now try simplifying the communication of complicated concepts, which almost everything in data analytics is complicated. Try to simplify that in a sentence or two to a business executive with impact. That is difficult, right? And to this day, I am learning how to do that better and better and better. So communication to different audiences, more specifically the business audience, uh, you know, is a skill uh, uh, that has stayed with me for years uh, that I can continue to enhance. The other one is tenacity, right? Nobody's going to get it the first time around. And so I'd like to think that, you know, when, when, when people dismiss an idea, it's not um, uh, a no, it's a not now. And so if you keep going back and having the conversation, lo and behold, there will come a day, there will come a time when they will have a big aha. And so it's important to frame your communications with them as being an ongoing activity uh, because it's a matter of time before you crack the business group that you're trying to crack and actually win them over. So tenacity is key. Mm -hmm. Well, when you look back now, What's one thing you wish someone had told you before you started working because you ended up, you know, learning it the hard way? Yeah, so I would say that knowledge is important, right? So a lot of your technical skill and other skills that you bring to the table are important. And I thought when I first started my career that that was it. You know, the person who's got the most knowledge should then, you know, um, uh, be allowed to, you know, run groups and, and, and progress in their career. But that's, that's the furthest thing from the truth in the corporate world, right? In the corporate world, knowledge has to translate to relationships and relationships are the key, right? And I think investing more time in your relationships and building quality relationships around the enterprise and with your vendors and with your uh, people, your peers, is even more vital 
than the knowledge uh, that you have. So I think I think that's that's. I wish somebody had told me that up front. And I didn't learn on the job. Well, now when you think about in recent times, if if you're hiring today, and let's let's focus here a little more on let's say the junior to mid levels in this scenario. What uh, what would you be looking for specifically that would help one candidate stand out from another? I know this is particularly relevant, for example, to our students who are about to go start interviewing for what could be their first job. You, as someone who's hired many people over the years, what are what are you looking for when they show up and talk to you? Yeah, on the junior side, I would say that technical skill is you know that those are table stakes, right? Um, we look to hire on you know how well somebody knows certain technologies. Um, but also how well does somebody adapt to change, right? Because one thing is constant in the business world is that the environment you walk into today is not the same environment as tomorrow. And it's very difficult to sort of experience that in the educational system, right? The educational system has not been designed to train for change, right? They design um, you, you know, to, to, to focus on acquiring certain skill sets and it's almost like a machine. But the piece that I, I, I want to make sure that students understand is that change is constant in the business world and how you adapt to that change and um, the emotions uh, that you express through that change are vital, right? And now on the mid-level side, um, what we look for is communication and delivery, right? And so at that point, it's less about technical implementation skill. It's more about how do you go about motivating others on your team, but also around you, specifically your business uh, compadres, if you will, on uh, you know onboarding an initiative, using data analytics in novel ways, right? These are all communication and trust building skills. So back to my earlier point, communication is vital. That's one of the things I look for uh, when I interview uh, mid-level folks and even senior level folks. I know that you're you're a person who has over the years put time in out of you know out of your personal time to to volunteer for and help support some various nonprofits and uh, you know what what's led you down that that part of your life and and what do you think you've gotten back from it that that then you also can reapply in your in your work life? Yeah, um, I really appreciate you bringing up that question because. What I do in my personal life and the causes I support uh, are near and dear to my heart. Um, I grew up in Central Africa, actually born and brought up there, right? And uh, I've had the great fortune of um, studying in the United States and then subsequently, you know, like I said earlier, um, accidentally connecting with uh, a set of data folks and, and that completely changed my career trajectory. Um, and, you know, Coming from Africa and, and being in Silicon Valley in the early days, I actually came to Silicon Valley in 1995. I saw that the strength of your passion can drive anything. And if you, if you witness the level of passion that Silicon Valley had in 1995, it compares to nothing that we have in Silicon Valley today. But when I look around the world, the level of passion that I see in Africa and the creativity of ideas that I see in Africa rivals what I saw in Silicon Valley in 1995. And a, and a fun fact that a lot of people don't know is that payments, uh, you know, electronic payments were not invented in Silicon Valley. They were actually invented in Nairobi, Kenya by farmers, right? So M-Pesa M -Pesa was actually the very first electronic payment system out there. And then we adapted it to U.S. use later on. Right, so there were very interesting innovations that have come out of Africa, but also Africa requires um, innovations that are very local to it, right? Because uh, there's a lot of infrastructure that doesn't exist there. And so there's a lot of novel uh, ways in which tech can help. Last mile delivery uh, uh, being an instance, right? Um, so I found that investing in uh, African tech really was a way of me giving back to you know the place where I came from. And through that, I've seen the tech ecosystem in Zambia specifically where I grew up uh, uh, blossom to the point where 
it's become an alternative for a lot of young people than taking on traditional mining jobs in the mines. And so we're starting to get a tech ecosystem out there where young people are now interested in it. The politicians are now interested in building a tech ecosystem out there because of the impact it has on jobs and also the community overall, right? Uh, in terms of uh, making lives better, healthcare better, finance better, lifestyles better uh, in, in countries uh, like Zambia. Well, before, before I run out of time with you, let's finish with uh, a look forward. What do you think, uh, given everything going on now, that over the next, say, three to five year horizon, will be some of the biggest ways that the world of analytics and data science is going to uh, change. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's been all this uh, hoopla over the last year about AI, right? And I love the opinion that without sound data, you don't really have AI. So I think AI can have tremendous impact. In fact, you know, I've been in AI since um, the 80s. Uh, but what we have to get together before we can make a measurable impact with AI is we need sound trusted data foundations. And today we've got a lot of data within corporations, but we have very little trusted data. We have very little integrated data. And these two key pieces are gonna be necessary before AI really makes any headway. But my, you know, make no mistake, AI is here to stay. AI can have massive impact on, on a corporation's profit, cost, revenue, and even risk profile. Um, so I think before AI becomes big, trusted data, integrated data foundations are going to become uh, big first. And I'm already starting to see a lot of investment in that area. There has been investment, but we, you're starting to see a lot of technologies being developed in that area. You're starting to see technologies um, that are focused on AI for data that actually make the discovery of data using AI easier and faster, right? And these are things that used to result in data programs actually uh, getting defunded because they took too long. And this is where I think AI can actually help data um, become faster and more effective. The other piece is timeliness of data. I really believe that the ultimate goal for corporations, the ultimate uh, competitive factor for corporations is to become proactive. When you become proactive in all aspects of running a company, it's a no operating model. So it's not just about making your operating processes more effective and efficient, but it's about making operating processes more forecastable in terms of what's about to happen that's going to go wrong. And so can we actually launch an AI to actually solve that problem before it becomes a problem for us, right? And so if we are going to make companies a lot more proactive, we have to change the pace at which data flows through the organization. We've got to increase, data will increase. The faster we flow data through an organization, it'll actually increase the heartbeat of the organization and make it more proactive. So there'll be a whole set of innovations around how we move data through corporations a lot more effectively and faster. But mark my words, I don't think a lot of those innovations will be tech only. We also have to innovate on the change management and human side because the human side is 90% of the effort of a technology initiative. And so I don't want to look at innovation just as, you know, what happens in Silicon Valley in tech. We've got plenty of that stuff. Our biggest bottleneck in the data space is the human change required to actually make effective use of these technologies once they've been, they've been developed and to actually quantify the value of them. And so there's got to be innovation on both those fronts. Well, Kyra, thank you so much for spending time with me today. And as I anticipated, you had a lot of good insights to share. So I'll, uh, I'll let you go now. But again, thanks so much for taking part in the show. Uh, thank you so much for having me, Bill. It's uh, always nice uh, chatting with you again. Uh, I really uh, have enjoyed our 20 years together.